We learned from Russia this weekend that what we do in video games can have dire consequences in the wrong environment. Good morning, good Monday morning to you, and happy Valentine's Day. I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for February 14th, 2022. It comes bright and early every weekday to our patrons who pledge at patreon.com sifted, and it's delayed a couple days for everyone else. If you like our content, we also have a separate podcast feed for our flagship show, Game Face, that you can find by searching your favorite podcast service. You'll find the podcast versions of the rest of our content in the same feed you found this. This weekend, it was reported that a Russian teenager was jailed for a plot to blow up an FSB building in Minecraft. Yes, in a video game. The FSB, if you're not familiar with it, is actually the new KGB. Like... <laughs> Once the Soviet Union crumbled, they really couldn't carry on with the KGB, but reportedly the FSB basically just took its place. And a group of friends in Russia, young teenage boys, built an FSB building in Minecraft and then started plotting to destroy the building in Minecraft. No, I'm not kidding, in Minecraft. They weren't plotting to blow up a real building it was a fake building that they built with a bunch of poorly textured blocks. One teenager was sentenced to five years for quote unquote training for terrorist activities. Russia is trying to say that the plot was a part to blow up real government buildings, which is absolutely not the case. Only one of the teens has a stiff prison sentence because the other teens essentially narked on him and turned him in and shared all the details. The court case was handled behind closed doors. This is insane, people. I mean, I don't have to tell you how crazy this is. Imagine creating a fake courthouse or a fake Capitol building in Minecraft, and then you and your friends over WhatsApp or via text or social media or whatever, you start talking about, hey, on Friday night, let's just have fun and just destroy it. And next thing you know, the FBI is at your door. I know this is hard to accept if you live in a free country, if you live in America or any of the other hundreds of countries around the world that have an open democracy where politicians are held to account, where rulers cannot be authoritarian and rule with an iron fist, where unjust rulings like this are virtually impossible, but they're not impossible in some places. And I think sometimes we need to appreciate what we have, appreciate where we live. It's very easy to complain because let's be honest, there's always messed up stuff going on everywhere, but there's a scale to it. Some of the things that we complain about, and I'll cop to it myself, I complain about things as well that are so petty compared to what happens in places like Russia. Think about China, where they put their citizens on an internet budget, and kids can only play games online for a set amount of time every week. Imagine that. Imagine the police coming to your door and saying, oh, we've been tracking your internet usage, and you're playing World of Warcraft too much, or you're playing League of Legends too much, or you're playing Call of Duty too much, and so we're going to shut it down. We're going to keep you from doing that. We are going to tell you what you can do with your free time. And look, I'm not trying to criticize anyone. As I said, I'm as guilty of complaining about stupid things as much as anyone else. But I think sometimes when you read stories like this, it should put things in perspective for you. And this is one way where staying engaged with the gaming industry can help put things in perspective for you. Stories like this happen all the time, but maybe you're not the type of person who wants to watch the news every night because you find it too depressing. Agreed. I don't really watch the news hardly at all. I can totally understand that perspective. Or you just don't have the time to keep up with things that are happening. But here we are with a story about gaming that can show how things are around the world, how our brothers and sisters 
who enjoy our hobby just as much as we do in other parts of the world are forced to either curtail or alter their love of the hobby because of the government. So next time you decide to rail on something government related, and I'm not saying that it's wrong or, or that it's not something that needs to be fixed, maybe just take a step back and think about what it's like for people in other places. Not everyone has it as good as we do. And I know I appreciate living in a free democracy every day. But when I read stories like this, I appreciate it all the more. Now for a couple more stories from the top of your sifts. First person psychological thriller adventure game Martha is Dead has been censored for PlayStation platforms, but not on Xbox or PC. The first person adventure is set in 1944 during World War II, and it does have some pretty stiff warnings. It is an M rated game, but it kind of goes above and beyond to warn the player of some things in the game that may disturb some folks. But, wow. When was the last time you can remember a game being only censored on PlayStation and not the other console? While the team behind the game has not shared exactly what it is about it that has caused it to be censored by PlayStation, it did say that while the game will launch digitally on both PS5 and PS4 on its launch date on Thursday, February 24th, its physical release will now be delayed up to a year to an undisclosed date. Not sure what's going on over in PlayStation land, or maybe it's something going on in Xbox slash PC land, because maybe there is something in this game that's just so abhorrent that it warrants this. Chances are it's not. <laughs> so either PlayStation has went way in the other direction, or Xbox and PC just doesn't care. And that's the thing about PC is like you're only restricted by the marketplaces that you sell games on. So there's no overlord, so to speak, like you normally would have a PlayStation or Nintendo or Xbox for that matter. On PC, it pretty much is a Wild West, unless Valve decides you can't sell it on Steam or Epic decides you can't sell it on the Epic Game Store. It's a case-by-case -case basis on that platform. And Microsoft, it just seems like, has just thrown the doors open and said, let's just do whatever. But for whatever reason, with this very particular game, PlayStation has decided that something was just too much. Rumors of a GoldenEye 007 HD remaster have been floating around for quite a while. A couple of weeks ago, Xbox Achievements appeared, complete with screenshots and descriptions, the whole shebang, the whole nine yards. And now, VentureBeast Jeff Grubb claims that it will be announced very soon and by Microsoft and not Nintendo. I'm not sure how much of a market there is for this at this point. If you go back and play it, it's not a great game at this point. It's still good, but it's not great. But you know how gaming nostalgia is. It can convince people to squeeze a couple dollars out of their wallets, even if they feel like they shouldn't. And on a side note, and maybe not coincidentally, GoldenEye is no longer banned in Germany after 24 years. The Uncharted movie released over the weekend to mass audiences, and the reviews are in. Right now, the movie is sitting at a 42 on Metacritic. Oddly enough, it's actually been praised for being a video game movie that's not dark and dreary, and for filling in the Indiana Jones hole that the movie industry is kind of suffering right now. But unfortunately, a lack of character development, too much green screen, and a lack of reference to the source material have kind of doomed it. Ironically, though, several critics claim that they would like to see a sequel, and, according to them, the film leaves the possibility wide open. Do you remember when Take-Two tried to buy Codemasters, and instead, EA ended up outbidding them and getting the predominantly driving studio into its portfolio? Well, Take-Two isn't giving up. For whatever reason, it feels that driving games are extremely important. And so it's decided to get one of its studios, Visual Concepts, to work on a quote-unquote AAA open-world driving game with a major license. Visual Concepts, you may remember, is probably best known for creating the NBA 2K franchise, the NFL 2K franchise, back in the Dreamcast era. That's when the studio really came to prominence. Now it's working on still NBA 2K, but it's also now creating the WWE games. 
The Smart Money is on VC taking on the Midnight Club franchise, a game that Pactor has mentioned constantly that Rockstar should be working on, that should be the next Rockstar game that comes out. Take-Two owns that license, and it could very easily hand it over to one of its other in-house studios. I'm not 100% sure that Visual Concepts is the best match for a racing game, but it's actually shocked me over the last decade or so at how it's really spread its wings and worked on genres that I would have never imagined back in the Dreamcast era. So, Midnight Club, if we can't get it from Rockstar, let's see what Visual Concepts can do. The MPD numbers are in for January 2022, and game spending was down 2% year over year for the month. The top-selling game was Pokemon Legends Arceus for the Nintendo Switch. Rainbow Six Extraction debuted at number 9. That is not good, people. For a Rainbow Six game, those usually do very well in their first month or two. On the flip side, Monster Hunter Rise, which had a decent run and decent sales on the Switch, and God of War jumped to number 3 and number 5 respectively, but that's because they were both just released for PC. Looking at hardware sales, the PlayStation 5 was a top-selling console, Xbox Series took the second slot, while Switch dropped to number 3. But if you've been following the industry, you know that month by month, console sales are driven entirely by supply. So likely, Sony managed to get out a nice batch of PS5s to sell in January, Xbox did the same, while Switch is trying to catch up with the lack of inventory over the holiday season. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight. Welcome to today's Boss Fight, where I tackle random topics that may or may not be related to video games. Today I want to talk about something that only old players like me can understand. And in fact, maybe only old games journalists can understand. The other day I was just kind of taking account of my career a little bit, and I started thinking about how many games have I played? And that number was mind-boggling. When I really started adding it up, it became overwhelming. And I got sick of trying to count, and so I shifted gears. And I thought, okay, well, how many games have I reviewed? And that number is pretty staggering, too. <laughs> I just did a very quick search of my hard drive and just did a search for the word review, and then sorted by Word documents. And then I did the same thing for Game Eval, so I could count all the Game Evals that I've written for Sifted across the years. And just on this PC, I had 700 reviews. Now, I had another laptop that I had during my GT era and the last couple years of my time at G4 and X-Play. And that had hundreds of reviews on it. And I made the mistake of when I got rid of the laptop, I did not transfer those reviews over to my main PC. So those are lost forever, <laughs> unfortunately. But suffice to say that I've played and reviewed just a couple thousand games at least throughout my career, throughout my time playing games. And then I started thinking back to what I remember and don't remember about these games. Because there's a famous saying that, oh, I've forgotten more than you know about something. And I think for maybe players who are in their early 20s, that's probably the case because I've kind of lived two lifetimes playing games compared to someone that age, at my age anyway. And being in the profession that I'm in where, I wouldn't say I'm forced, but it's my job to just keep playing games and keep evaluating games and keep reviewing games. And as I started to look through those lists of reviews that are on my hard drive, I realized that I have written reviews for games that I remember next to nothing about. I may remember, you know, it's the second game in the series. I may remember a very rough outline of the plot. But other than that, I remember hardly nothing. Now, granted, most of those games are smaller games, games that I end up giving lower review scores to. 
So you would say, oh, well, you know, maybe your mind compartmentalizes those things. And it says, oh, Shane, you don't need to remember this game because it's not memorable. But I don't really think that that's the case. I think at a certain point, your brain does filter things. And I don't want to say your brain gets full because that's absurd because everyone learns new stuff every day. But I do think that as you learn new things and you get older, some of the things at the earlier part of your memory start to drop off. I used to have an encyclopedic knowledge of the Nintendo 64 library and the Dreamcast library. And to a certain extent, the Super Nintendo. But now I think back on a lot of the games that I played and I remember very little about them. But the things that I do remember, and this is what I've noticed, the things that I do remember about those games, where I only remember a couple things, are almost generally shaped by who I was and what I valued at the time that I played those games. I place a lot of emphasis on emergent gameplay elements. New things, things that developers try that are different from the status quo. And I think once you get to my age, if you continue to play games at the pace that you are now or that I have for my entire life, I think you'll start to see that in yourself as well. I can think back to all these games that I cannot remember the plot. I can't remember who the main characters were in the game. I can't remember huge plot twists from those games. I, again, I can probably tell you a rough outline of what it was about, maybe like a sentence or two. But if that game did something unique in the gameplay, not only will I remember it, I will remember how it worked, what was good about it, and even what didn't work. And I think what it's shown to me is that the person that you are, the people that you're around, the things that happen to you in a given point in your life shapes how you perceive everything in your life. And that includes pop culture. Games, film, TV. And I mean, a big part of that, obviously, is that whatever your interests are, that's where you're going to go. So, you know, I've been a gameplay first guy my whole life. So organically, if I had the choice to play games in the past, I would play games that are gameplay driven and not so story driven. So that that lends a little bit into what I remember or what I don't remember. But again, it's shaped by who I was at the time and what I valued. It just so happens that I've continued to value the same thing. So I look back across my career and all the games I've played, and it's sad. It, it, it bothers me that I cannot remember everything about all the games that I've played. Now, I don't have a photographic memory or anything like that, but I do have a pretty good memory. I did well in school, and I would argue that doing well in school is more about having the ability to memorize things than actually having a high IQ. Having a high IQ means that you're strong at critical thinking skills. You have an ability to look at things and kind of figure out what the logical conclusion of those instances will probably be. Being able to memorize things, that's completely different. So I've always been able to memorize stuff. I've always been able to ace tests if I even spent an hour studying for them. But I can't remember a lot of this stuff. And this is my career. <laughs> One of the reviews I came across was Headhunter for the Dreamcast. And what I remember about it is that it was trying to be an open world game in the advent of Grand Theft Auto 3 and the advent of open world games. It was trying to be an open world game that wasn't. You had a motorcycle and that's it. <laughs> and I remember the shooting and the actual combat in the game was poor, but that's it. I played that game for like 20 hours. That's what blows my mind. There are games that I have spent 40, 50 hours playing and it's hard for me to remember anything about the game other than the gameplay. Tales of Symphonia is one of them. I remember when I played that game, I thought the plot was okay. I didn't think it was amazing, but I thought it was okay for a JRPG. But what I remember about it is the active combat. It was an action RPG before the era of action RPGs. So I remember kind of how the combat worked, but I remember next to nothing else about the game. And so... When I realized this, I'm like, what can I do to change it? How can I remember more 
about what I play. And I don't think that that's something that you can control. I mean, sure, you can take notes for every game that you play, and maybe you can go back and reference them later and read them. Or maybe just the act of taking notes will help you remember that stuff. But I'm writing reviews for these games. I wrote 1,000 words, 2,000 words, 3,000 words after playing these games for 30, 40 hours. And I remember very little about them. It's crazy. So I wonder, I'm like, is this a black hole for me? In most cases, obviously, it was my job to do this. So I wouldn't say it was like a waste of time because... I needed to review the game to do my job, to get paid, to put food on the table, and to pay my rent. But when you think about 40 hours of your life that you don't remember much about, it's it's hard for me to think of other 40-hour periods in my life that I don't remember much about at all. I mean, it just doesn't happen. And so the conclusion that I've come to is that everything just bleeds together way too much. And I think this is one of the detriments of being a games critic is that you're on this squirrel wheel. You're constantly playing games. And what happens is they start to bleed together. And I think at first your mind overlaps the facts with two games into one set of facts, even though they may not even be that closely related in genre or any or style or story or anything like that or setting. I think what happens is your brain starts to overlap that stuff. And then after a while, it just completely filters that information, that Venn diagram. It just deletes it. And so I think in a lot of ways, it's an indictment on the industry. That one, it's kind of slow to move and kind of slow to change. And in general, a lot of games are really similar. They have a different character. They have a different plot. But being a gameplay first guy, gameplay transforms maybe more slowly than anything else. There are still elements from The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time that we still see in games today. And so if I play 20 more games after Ocarina of Time that has a Z-lock, where you're locking onto enemies, and now that's just the way action games are, that's one of those elements that overlaps the Venn diagram that I believe over time your brain starts to delete the information. I don't know. Am I crazy? What do you guys think it is? Do you guys remember every moment of every game you've ever played? And I would also argue that in some ways, you're the lucky ones because you get to pick and choose what you play. You get to select what goes into your mind. And maybe you are capable of controlling it better and remembering more. I don't know. I'd love to hear your feedback on this. Do you guys remember everything that you've played across the years? Because I definitely do not. Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate every single one of you who listens to Good Morning Gaming. I'm Shane Satterfield. Just go ahead and do what all the cool kids do and follow me on Twitter at Denfire. And while you're there, head on over to at Sifted Games and follow the site as well. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow. But until then, make sure you seize today because there will never be another.